Thanks, Jade. Everyone give it up for Jade. How good is Jade doing? Anyway, um, all, the, all the keen people are here right now, because everyone else is having afternoon tea, which is good, so we've got the keen SEOs. So I'm here to talk about the third pillar of SEO, user interaction. How Google works, from what I can tell, and then now what do we do about it? So seven years ago, I was this guy. I was working in-house as a digital marketing assistant, and I had no clue about SEO, and I was given the, uh, the job of working with a certain SEO provider, which won't be named, and they were doing some um, dubious work, and it kind of got me a bit curious about what they're doing, and got me investigating SEO for myself. They were building this stellar content strategy with uh, location pages with, in suburbs that we weren't located. That got me a bit curious, first red flag. The second one, these juicy links. So we've got missimmigrant.org on an insecure server with this directory. We've got a, a blatant PBN. And we even made it to page four of their admin. So all of this kind of work that was going on got me curious about SEO and kind of researching myself. I was doing a bit of Googling to find out what is SEO and are they taking us for a ride? And I came across this guy. So I won't say anything negative about Neil Patel in case anyone's a fan. At the time, he was the best I had. And he kind of started talking about PBNs. And I was like, this, I think these guys are doing a PBN right now. I'm going to check, check out what they have to say for themselves. And I called them out and I said, um, you know, you're running this PBN. It's pretty clear. And they said, Google will not, will not penalize us because we're a Google partner agency. So I had no clue. I hadn't been in the game that long. But now I know that's a whole bunch of BS. Um, so this kind of got me thinking that SEOs cannot be trusted. Um, which is kind of ironic now, because I'm, I'm a bit of an SEO. So, seven years later, I still think it, it kind of depends, um, as all things in SEO, and I've become this guy. <laughs> passionate about SEO, and I, I, I really am passionate about the channel. Um, so, in Chiang Mai last year, in November, the whole team, we went out to Chiang Mai SEO conference, one of the top conferences in the world. Uh, James spoke, and we were lucky to go part and learn from some of the best SEOs in the industry. We had the backlink boys hanging out the front of the villa. <laughs> a lot of networking going on. I'm sure there's a few networking going on tonight. <laughs> and uh, all, all the while this is going on, Google is having a bit of a moment, having a hot moment. We had six updates between August and November, and we're coming across some of the, the best and brightest minds in SEO in Chiang Mai, and people's sites were falling like flies. So the kind of premise of the, of the conference which is most conferences, is how do we gain Google? How do we understand what they want? And how do we manipulate the algorithm for our own benefits? And uh, all while this is going on, we're talking to some, uh, some attendees at Chiang Mai SEO, and we're saying, what's the most important thing about SEO? What do you think it is? And I was like, I think it's the user experience. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'll tell you about SEO. First you get the links, then you get the money, and then you got the user. <laughs> The funny thing is, is that we've all seen sites like this, and it actually works. So um, it got me thinking, does Google work like it says it works? If not, how does it actually work? And that's kind of where this piece of journalism came out. And it was the seven must-see Google search ranking documents of the anti-trial exhibits. So if you're not aware, Google's getting sued by the US government. And as part of that, a whole bunch of the ways that Google is working has been brought out into the light. And for SEOs, that's great, because we get to understand a bit more behind the scenes. So what did we learn? So first, we learned about the three pillars of ranking. And we've always thought user interactions was important, but we understand the extent it was. So first, you've got body, which is on-page SEO. You've got anchors, which is links. And then third, you've got user interactions. So what the, what the document says about itself, what the web says about the document, and then what users are saying about the document. So Mike Grain was actually back uh, back, I was onto this back in 2002, where he presented um, the three pillars of ranking being page content, hyperlink analysis, and usage data. And funnily enough, he coined it EAT 22 years ago. This is a document that really got people talking. Google saying that they actually can't understand content, that they fake it. Essentially, um, they've, they've addressed how they used click data in the past, but they're very uh, cagey about to the extent that they're using it. And from what I could see, the only real kind of evidence that people, that Google officially saying how it uses click data, it's for related results, where a user will interact with a, with a link on a page, they'll have a bad time, they'll go back, the results will be refined, um, and things like that. And from the documents, you could see the kind of signals that Google is measuring. 
And these documents, you know, they're all pre-2020. They've had massive AI updates since then. But it's still kind of it's interesting to see how Google's working and nonetheless. So looking at things like, are people reading it? Are they clicking on it? Are they scrolling it? Are they hovering their mouse over it? Um, and essentially what they were saying is that they've QA'd the content, the quality assurance to its users. They're not able to determine, is this a good piece of content? Is it helpful? What is it? They're just saying, does the user enjoy it? Are they having a good time? Let's keep it ranking. Um, the funny thing is that user interaction is actually difficult to evaluate. Uh, we're, all, we're all users here, um, whether or not you like to be thought of that way. Uh, we're all complex people with different dreams and ambitions and different needs. And uh, evaluating that in some kind of statistical sense is quite difficult. Google is quite open about how tech SEO works. I believe it's because it's in their interest to keep call efficiency uh, quite um, working well for the web because it reduces their operational expenses. So we know how tech SEO works, but now we can see the ranking life cycle as well. So what happens here is you've got um, a user makes a query, searches a query, the query is interpreted, um, and they're drawing this. This is why tech SEO is so important. The web documents that they have in there that have called an index previously, so you have not indexed, you're not even considered. And they're assigning a score out of these documents, adjusting the ranking, and then you get your SERP. I uh, did a big, bit of a deeper dive to see what's happening between the query rewriter and the super root um, stage. So the meaning of the query is determined based on modern NLP. I think when these documents came out, they actually used in user interaction to determine what search intent was. So they'll look at someone searching for a query, and if they're clicking on um, a commercial page or an informational page, then they're able to decide this is how user, the search intent is determined. But they've advanced a bit since then. Then they determine the relevance of the content using systems like BERT, quality of the content, whether that's dubious in some circumstances. Then they determine the usability of pages. This is where things like core web vitals and mobile usability are important. Then the context of the user. So you're searching from Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne, um, what device you're searching on, and then they determine the SERP results. So we found out how search does not work. It's not a one-way dialogue between scoring documents and ranking them and slapping a UX in the middle. We found out that when a new search is um, made, so most 15% uh, or so of all searches are new, um, Google doesn't know how users will interact with these documents. So they, they use click as a vote in the SERPs, and then they base uh, whether that was a good experience for the user with the interaction of the document, and then they adjust it using logging, which is that nice little log there, and they apply that for learning. But it goes a bit deeper than that. So they're actually applying user interaction at every single stage of the search um, journey. So the results, the, the, the links you're clicking on, the actual UX of the SERP itself. So if you search for something and then you start clicking on an image or a news carousel or something like that, that's going to change the, uh, the UX of the SERP. The user experience, as I said earlier, and then that's all going to be logged and uh, readjusted the next time someone searches. And over billions and billions of searches, this gets quite intelligent. So as I said, clicks are seen as a vote in the SERPs. This is from one of the documents. Um, and now with all this intel, how does Google work? Well, to understand that, we have to understand how Google used to work. So it used to work based on backlinks and the last click. So this was discovered in a book written by Stephen Levy. He was a journalist that had inside access to Google in the early founding days. Steve Toss has talked about this as well. Um, some other interesting patents um, that measure user interaction. Things like the reasonable surfer patent. Just when I say things about patents, it doesn't mean that Google ever used this or is still using it. But it's interesting to see that they may be using it. Um, so use interaction at a link level. Um, so say you have document A linking to document B. If someone is linking, uh, interacting with that link on document A, that impacts the page rank flowing to document B. And page rank still is a ranking, um, fact, or a ranking system if you look at Google's documentation. Site quality score, I love this one. So this was first filed in 2012, um, became active in 2021. I believe it's extremely important for search and for, for webmasters. This basically looks at uh, someone, how they interact as a website as a whole, and then they score, sign on a score to um, how someone's interacting with this entire website, and then they determine whether that's a good quality website or not. So it's not just looking at the page level, it's actually looking at the entire website as well. Has Google evolved? Some of these documents are quite old. Um, so 
I asked, well, we found out from some of the top SEOs in the industry have weighed in on the antitrust ex exhibit, such as Kevin Indig in Elephant in the Room. He's saying that what we used to think was important for Google, such as content, backlinks, and user signals, is now inverted. It's all user signals, backlinks, and content, as Google is not quite um, as good as we thought at understanding content. As well, Barry Adams weighed in on the subject as well in his um, piece called Turns Out Google is All About Links and Clicks. So he believes that Google's essentially strong in determining link and click signals, but very poor in determining quality content. That's why you see some really poor spammy sites ranking from now, um, now and again. Yeah, but he also said in a second email to me when I followed up with him, that he believes that keywords and entities and things like that being associated with the page um, also determines relevance and things like that as well. So has Google evolved that much since these documents came out? Definitely. And we've seen some great presentations such as on Jeb and I and all of that um, this morning. But let's have a look back and see how Google's AI systems have evolved over time. So we've got the knowledge graph with the introduction of entities. Google started investing in a database of facts of public and um, licensed verified uh, sources as well as uh, content-owned data sources as well to have publicly objective facts about the world. Then you have um, RankBrain, which was allow allowed them to understand how a query relates to real-world concepts, get a bit more intelligent. Then neural matching, which was allowing them to look beyond just keywords on a page and understand how queries relate to an entire page itself. Then we brought the introduction of BERT, which understand complex language. Um, and this really improved their long-tail query results. So they're able to rank and retrieve documents that are more related to a search. And now we've got MUM. Um, MUM is multi-task unified model. Can't remember all the time. But it's not currently used broadly in search. It's being used for generating um, consensus, consensus amongst featured snippets. So if multiple sources are saying the same thing, they'll determine that it's more likely than not that it's true. Um, it's capable of understanding and generating language as well. It's multilingual, so it can grab great information about climbing Mount Fuji in Japan, if it's written in Japanese, and then give that to an English user. Um, it's multimodal, so it can understand not just text, but also understand video and, and uh, audio and things like that as well. And it says that, well, it claims to have a compre comprehensive understanding of information and real world knowledge. So as far as we know, beyond um, trying to weave out some kind of uh, misinformation around COVID vaccines. Mum wasn't really broadly applied to search ranking for, for ranking purposes yet. So I'll be mainly talking about BERT from the rest of this presentation. So I've got a little correlation study and, you know, correlation isn't causation, but did a little bit of an analysis of one of our old clients from some of their data sources. To get a true study, you need to have access to not just one website, but all of its competitors and be able to determine whether this page has more dwell time or more scroll depth to determine whether or not user interaction is truly um, important. But there's some interesting insights on the less. So clear in indication, this is meant to be a, well, that's the wrong one, wait. Can anyone see a, um, not working? It's meant to be a laser pointer. Um, so clear indication between CTR and clicks, which just makes a lot of sense. You see that top green at the top with CCR. Um, what's happening here? Okay, it was working. All right. Anyway, move on. Anyway, this is <laughs> saying the clear association to CTR and this one works. Oh, I meant to hold it down. Okay, that's probably what was happening. <laughs> Okay, um, CTR and, and, and clicks, which makes a lot of sense, but also Google saying how clicks are seen as a vote in the SERPs. Clear association between links and click, cl amount of clicks. Average session duration actually in the red up the top. Um, but you meant to compare these against um, other websites in the SERPs, so can't really determine that. Page load speed time in the red. Word count doesn't seem to be much of a factor, but everything's contextual in search, so you can't just compare one page and its average scores against, you know, it's, everything's contextual to the variations of queries and, and that kind of stuff as well. So knowing all this, what do we do about it? Which is an important part. Um, so 
to break it all down, user interaction is the like, intersection between SERP interaction and page interaction. So what goes into a user's mind um, and what kind of cognitive biases do they have when they're making a the decision to make a click on a particular page in a SERP for a particular query? So you've got the clear association between position and click-through rate because you know, it's, it's up the top. People aren't going to want to scroll down. Compelling title and description. James gave some great hacks and tips for that in the, in the morning session. Relevant title and description. So is it relevant to the query search? Um, Google rewrites titles a lot these days, so probably less important. Other things that we can uh, really be in control of is domain name relevancy for that query, as well as the legitimacy soundingness of the domain. So Jonas talked about Sippy Cup Mum. I don't know if we will be clicking on them, but you know. Um, brand awareness and trust. So this is more at the enterprise level where if there's negative coverage about your brand in the, in the media, is that going to impact a user's decision to click on your, your link and do business with you? I don't, I'm not sure. It could very well be. Preasy of positive experience with the website. Have they been there before? Did they have a good time? Are they coming back again? Do they trust you? So the reason Google doesn't want to let people know is because of the black hats. Um, and this is the stuff that the online casino affiliates have been doing for like 10 plus years. They've been gaming Google using CTR manipulation. Um, I'm not an expert on this topic. Never done it, but we met many casino affiliates at Chiang Mai SEO, and they swear by it. Um, CTR manipulation-ish, like light CTR manipulation, I call it, like enterprise white hat, where you're telling um, someone to search something directly and then um, getting them to click on you. This is kind of vague because it's somewhat branded, but can be done. Now for user interaction tips. Once they land on the page, what can we do about that? Um, content depth. So I believe people have been talking about Nap Lab today. So just because someone has written a 6,000 word review of a mattress doesn't mean they're going to read it, but they might have a bias towards trusting you because they've gone to the full length and depth of covering the entire topic of that mattress. Um, the quality of the content speaks for itself. Internal linking, things like Nick Ranger spoke about. Giving users an, uh, an opportunity to interact with multiple pages within your, within your website. That's a very important thing. Then. In, um, Having really good, rich imagery. We've seen this work really well for our clients. So not just relying on AI images, stock images. Um, having custom images for your content, data visualizations, a good UX and UI and design, all very important. Multimodal content. As we're talking about mum, the future of content SEO, in my view, is multimodal, if it's not already. Video, audio, moving beyond text. And then finally, symmetric messaging. So symmetric messaging, messaging is it's basically a concept that I learned through working with some of the best CROs in Australia. Um, it's when you have, it's mainly using paid media. So when the creative of an ad matches the landing page experience for the user. So say a tradie um, is wanting to do, a, like see an account, sees an ad about accounting, they see an image of a tradie, they say, oh, that's, that's like me. But if they click through to the landing page experience, if it's a picture of a healthcare work, worker, they might bounce back and have not, a good experience. So it's having a symmetric message between the ad and the landing page. But how do we apply this to SEO? Well, I believe you can use that in things through like title tag optimization. So having an offer in the title tag um, and have a landing page experience that matches that. So having discount co uh, discounts, having from things like that, um, compelling kind of CTAs and title tags. So kayak here from $30 a day sounds pretty good. You reach a landing page, you save a dollar, $29. You have a great time. What am I going to do with that dollar? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a positive user experience because you've matched what the message has been in the SERP and you've given that reward to the user when they land the page. And they're more likely to interact with the page further on through symmetric messaging. Now, what's my approach for SEO? And I believe that we can't just give broad advice in SEO. That's bad. Um, but I just kind of talk about like what's good and what's been working for me. Um, I see low competition SERPs, query relevance, you can get rankings. You know, just being the most relevant uh, page for that query, you can, get, you can simply get some rankings through the power of BERT. Secondly, more difficult SERPs, quality content, things like content depth, and that's reinforced through logging and things like that, through user interaction, which then changes the rankings, so forth. And then, the most difficult SERPs, 
you need site authority. It's hard to rank these days without an authoritative site. Um, unless you're going super specific, um, people are arguing niche sites are out, authority sites are in. And the, the whole premise that Parasite SEO is a thing is based on this whole argument of site authority. But this talks about user interaction. Um, so yeah, you need all the three things going on when it's more difficult about SERP, for SERPs. So ultimately, if Google can read content, if it's doing a good job at reading content, who cares? Um, I don't care. I probably should. Because users have read content. And that's the most important thing. So say, what I say next, take with the entire millilit like microgram of salt. So one guy I, we've, I'm in contact with, uh, I met in Chiang Mai, he's been investing in content, extremely investing in it, going to the extent of buying products, recording videos, reviewing it, having deep guides, he's putting his blood, sweat, and tears into his site. And he got absolutely slapped by those updates at the end of the last year. So with the Prosperity Media, we mainly work with mid to enterprise clients. They have established link profiles, they have brand, branded search, and a lot of things going for them that other sites might not have. But my approach to SEO is more content, quality content. So here's one award-winning campaign we've got with, enterprise, with uh, Prosperity. So this content cluster we built got over a million dollars of revenue for one of our clients. Here's some of the engagement signals. So I think a good engagement rate on average is around 60% or above. One of the metrics I really love at the moment is user engagement. So you can see the total time that someone's been on your website. So you don't think that deep about like one person spending a minute on your website, but you times that by 100,000. You know, people are spending months of time on your website. Give them something good to, to, to see. Give them some quality. Um, average session duration, pages per session. Another award-winning campaign for a um, best content marketing campaign. Um, I give full credit to Amy, Frank, people like that. I'm not writing content. Um, but yeah, we've got some of the best content SEOs at Prosperity. Um, great engagement, future award application, good engagement, future award application, blah, blah, blah. Um, user interaction, I believe that the future of SEO is the intersection between user interaction and content for SEO. Because writing a good piece for SEO we all know isn't the most compelling piece of content. And the writing the most compelling piece of content is not gonna rank. So you need to have compelling content for SEO purposes. And that's kind of that intersection where you have engaging content for SEO, going beyond just having the right H1 tags. Give, them, give something more. Give, data, give unique data. Give unique imagery. So now I've become more of a content-led SEO enthusiast. Um, if you want a job, get in touch. <laughs> and I have all my presentations and templates all in one link if you want to scan that. Um, and there's some more contact details. I'm not sure if I'm going over time. Okay. <laughs>